can you all see the normal view or is that is that okay excellent so uh in my five minutes i'm going to give you sort of a broad overview of my lab um which i'm calling translational pulmonary immunology um my postdoc pointed out we do finally have a disclosure um which is not so bad to have but i thought i would just say that at the outset since this is an alums talk we read this paper early on in our um i thrive time 2019 to 2021 and this like figure really struck me i was like this is this is what i want to do this sounds really cool this is where i want to be so I really like the idea of sitting at the interface of a lot of sort of basic translational clinical processes. Um, and this is aspirational and by no means do we achieve this, but uh, it's sort of inspired the layout of my group, which is that we focus on lung inflammation and fibrosis. I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor. We use clinical data. We use mouse models of disease mechanisms and our techniques focus on some high dimensional immunophenotyping where we look at immune cells and how they move in and out of the lung. Uh, and our main focus is around B cells. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about a type of B cell. But we look at these B cells, the antibodies that they make, how those uh, different things interact with lung resident stromal cells uh, to contribute to disease and repair. Um, and so we apply different things to this. Um, it wasn't part of my initial plan, but we, uh, you know, responded to the pandemic and look at things uh, COVID related to this. We look at this type of chronic scarring lung disease called interstitial lung disease. We look at different drugs and how these impact these like immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are used in cancer. Um, and then a I drive scholar, um, Ava Otopalova is a um, fellow in my lab who's going to look at TB. So um, we are we are um, happy to look at anything that is interesting and may come with money. Uh, but the type of cells that we focus on are these B1 cells, which if you recently got a vaccine, it's the B2 cells that are really active in you. These are the classic sort of adaptive um, that um, B cells that everyone learns about. B1 cells are on this other side of humoral immunity and we think they make mostly natural IgM and some IgA that we consider to be protective from various types of inflammation to really make broad strokes about it. <clears throat> They're evolutionarily conserved across species. These antibodies bind lots of different epitopes, including autoantigens and infections. And what's really cool about them from a lung doctor's perspective is that they localize to the serosal cavity, so the pleural cavity, the space around the outside of the lung, at least in mice. Um, and they respond to different kinds of damaged self like oxidized LDL or apoptotic cells to modulate the immune response and the uh, response to injury. And so in prior work in the lab, we, we used mouse models to say, okay, if we increase the number of these B cells and IgM, which is shown here. So if we use this lung injury model called bleomycin, we can show that these cells are recruited to the lung where they make oxidation specific or OSE IgM. And that those things are correlated with protection from, from fibrosis. And so work that we've gone on to do is to say, okay, well, what happens in humans? And so I wanted to focus on some work from Ava, who I just mentioned already. So we have a cohort of um, patients with ILD that we measured these antibodies in the plasma. And in keeping with that hypothesis, turns out that patients with fibrotic lung disease have lower levels of IgM circulating and specific ones to this particular epitope. Um, but what's really cool is that they have really increased levels of IgA, which was a surprise. Both total IgA, which was previously shown in some other studies, but specifically IgA to these different oxidation-specific epitopes. <clears throat> and those are inversely correlated with lung function. So FVC, more FVC in theory in this case is good. So more P1 IgA, which is this type of IgA that we're studying, is bad related to lung volume and related to how lungs exchange oxygen with the air. And in patients um, with disease, it's associated with worsening disease. So we're now making a switch to look at a lot of things related to IgA, uh, thanks to Ava's work. And then I'm not going to have time to go into it, but Riley is a postdoc in the lab who just loves taking pictures. And there's some beautiful pictures where we're looking at laminin, um, which is a basement membrane protein 
for um, tissue remodeling. And uh, I will have to fly through these slides, but basically we map laminin over the tissue. We do a histogram of lam laminin staining, and then we can correlate that with disease and show that essentially immune cells are associated with um, fibroproliferative changes in the lung. So I'm already over, but I wanna thank way too many people to thank, but I wanted to highlight the scholars class of 2021, which is uh, one of the best parts of the program is getting to know these folks uh, and seeing some of them on the screen. So I will take questions in the remaining 30 seconds. Thank you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks, Sandra. Sorry, I was a whirlwind. I can also stop the share so that we can accelerate. Mm -hmm. There you go. Because Alex, I'm sure, has something more interesting to say than me. <laughs> okay. I don't know if that's true, but at least I got my slides working. <laughs> or at least I hope. Can you see the? You can see them. Okay. Are there any? Should we keep pausing for? There are questions for Jeff or? I think you can keep going, yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna talk through really briefly um, what my lab does. I am also an alum, but a year behind, um, I think a year or two behind Jeff, I'm not sure. Uh, but so what are we really interested in studying? We're really interested in the gut-brain axis. And so I think this is illustrated really nicely in a study by Adolf, it's actually done way back in the 40s, where he adulterated um, rat chow with cellulose, basically. And what he found, and this is a kind of complicated graph, um, like hand-drawn, I love old figures, anyway, was that the, the rats compensated. They ate more food to account for the indigestible cellulose. And what he concluded was essentially that rats eat for calories. So rats are able to take information from the gut and change their behavior. Um, the study is important because it's really the first demonstration of that. And it's important because it stands in stark contrast to basically every other study that follows it with an instead of adulterating that food with cellulose, you change that to foods that are common in the modern food environment. So rats fed a cafeteria diet or a diet of kind of mixed like modern Western diet. So a popular one of these has cheesecake or frosting or sausage, and bacon. These rats gain weight. They gain huge amounts of weight. And so these rats are unable to take information about nutrients in the gut and then regulate and compensate their behavior. And so what my lab essentially asks from the view of the gut brain axis is why? What is it about the modern food environment that makes it so difficult for us to change eating behavior and makes overconsumption such a problem? Um, and we kind of are exploring three hypotheses. One is that they, these, the foods in the modern food environment are composed of evolutionary novel combinations of macronutrients. The second is that they deliver those calories to the gut rapidly. And the third is that they contain additives that alter taste and mouthfeel. And my iThrive project really focused on the second, so I'm just going to go through that one briefly now. Um, and so we know that ultra-processed foods and modern foods are simply consumed more quickly. They're eaten more rapidly. The only uh, randomized control tile to date um, on ultra-processed foods, the data from that showed that people ate more quickly and they gained more weight on an ultra-processed diet. And so if we're thinking about, you know, food, so those foods are going into the body more quickly, they're hitting the gut more quickly. There's also evidence that though these foods in our modern food environment are kind of, these calories are divorced from their food matrix, meaning they're more easily bioaccessible. They're easy to digest. I feel like this is kind of intuitive. If you think about like whole grain bread versus white bread, right? Those white bread calories are more accessible. So what is another area where speed matters? Um, drugs of abuse. This is basically known as the rate hypothesis. And all this is, is that drugs that get to the brain faster are, have a higher addictive potential. And again, you know, people, clinicians kind of thinking about route of administration, something injected or snorted has a much higher abuse potential than something ingested. And essentially our question was just to ask, is the same true for food? So are 
flavors that are paired with calories that are more rapid, do those flavors become more liked, more wanted, more attractive than the flavors that are paired with slower calories? Um, and uh, we're going to go through this quick. So I was, this is we're using flavor nutrient conditioning, which is basically where you take a flavor and you pair it with a, a caloric consequence. The classic way to do this is to pair it with calories versus no calories. And for the bet, the flavor that contains calories, you'll see an increase in rated liking and wanting. Instead, what we did was manipulate the speed at which those calories are uh, delivered. So instead of calories versus no calories, we still have no calories, um, but then we have calories that are digested slowly. So this is a long chain carbohydrate, maltodextrin. And then we have calories that are digested quickly. This is just sucrose, table sugar. And as we can see, you get this fast rise of blood glucose for the CS fast, as well as this fast increase in carbohydrate oxidation. So these are our fast calories. And then if we ask people just simply, do you like the flavor? In this case, there's no calories in the flavor. They're just tasting it and telling us how much they like it. They tend to like the flavor that has been paired with those fast calories more than the flavor that's been paired with slow calories. Um, and more than the flavor that's been paired with no calories. So this kind of provides us with preliminary evidence um, that kind of this rate of, of absorption matters. And it could be something that explains why these foods are so overconsumed. Um, and I'm just gonna leave my contact info up there maybe for a second. And then I'm definitely at time. That's awesome, thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. Can probably take one question. I have a question, Alex. Yeah. So I was wondering now that first exciting to see some of your data because I don't think I had always seen it before. So that was exciting. But also, um, like what is the next step after this study is done to move everything forward? So what's next now that you've found that potential correlation between number of calories, quickness of metabolism, and preference? Yeah, so we're doing a couple things. The first one is, so we need to finish this study. So that was a couple people and we need to run like 60. Um, so I think Better that was than no people. That I showed you. So um, we're also moving this into the scanner. So we're looking at brain correlates um, of these effects. So wanting to see the brain response to those flavors of fast versus slow. Um, also, you know, one of the great things that iThrive has done for me is um, is working with Alex Hanlon's group is that we are also going to do predictive modeling with this data set. So we've kind of come up with a huge number of, we collect a lot of information on these participants, um, a lot of information about their metabolic um, responses, their brain responses. And we're actually gonna feed those into random forest models to see if this speed factor is actually the best predictor and if there are other factors. And so then our goal is to use that data-driven method to generate new hypotheses. And so is it something particular about maybe the individual's glucose metabolism? And so then we can either recruit people who have altered glucose metabolism or try and manipulate that in some way. And so that's our goal is to use that data-driven method to then come up with uh, new hypotheses. Thanks. And with that, we'll transition to our third alum who's going to be presenting, and that's Kara Wiseman. Um, Kara was in the class of 2020 to 2022 for the Scholars Program. All yours, Kara. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will unmute myself. And can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay. So unlike the previous two speakers. I am not a um, bench scientist, so my slides are less fun. It's a lot of tables, and I focus on um, cancer prevention behavior, specifically tobacco use. So the um, today is exciting for me because it's the first time I'm actually presenting data from my iThrive project to anybody, and I'm so glad it's for the scholars and um, the other people who are here for this symposium. So I'm going to give you a very brief background about tobacco 
So people still use tobacco and it continues to be a major public health issue and is still the leading cause of preventable death in the United States. Important for this study is that as the rates of smoking have gone down at the population level, it's still um, more prevalent and kind of concentrated in specific populations. And for this study, I was interested in differences between people living in rural and non-rural parts of the state of Virginia, because in our rural areas, we tend to have higher smoking prevalence. They have different smoking patterns as well, smoking more, uh, more cigarettes per day and having higher levels of nicotine addiction. And so why that's important is that we have publicly available tools to help people quit smoking. And in particular, I'm interested in mobile health and how these can be scalable tools to help people change their cancer prevention behaviors. Um, so these can take many different forms. Well, what I'm going to be talking about today is text messaging, and that's a relevant potential um, mode for intervention because almost 100% of people in the U.S. own a cell phone. Most of those are smartphones, and there is less and less of a divide between smartphone ownership across our demographic groups. But when we're thinking about different parts of the population or different geographic areas, just because you have a cell phone doesn't always mean it works in all of our areas. So, you know, if you go to a rural part of the state, you might not have cell phone service every Everywhere, even if you have a cell phone or vice versa, if you live in an urban area, you might be in an office building where you also don't have good cell phone service. So thinking about the implementation of our public health programs, specifically this one text messaging program, I thought it would be really important to look at both the cultural and technology, technological potential differences between smokers living in rural and non-rural areas to look at the impact of program outcomes in these two populations. So that was what my iThrive study proposed. We wanted to recruit 60 participants stratified across rural and non-rural counties in Virginia. So you can see the map um, here. The blue was our rural counties and our orange was non-rural counties. We have relied on community partners for our recruitment for this study. So the Department of Health, a company called Virginia Premier, Blue Ridge Community Health, the Cancer Center, Center for Outreach and Engagement has been heavily involved. So we've had lots of community partners, mostly word of mouth recruitment. Our goal is to recruit 60 participants. We currently have 35, so that's exciting for us. It's kind of slow going. It's, it's hard to get people who want to quit smoking. Um, and so what I'm going to show in the next uh, couple of slides is just a snapshot of our baseline data of how I'm hoping to use these data once the program is completed so that we can really see, you know, do we need a program that can be available to everybody that can be the same program, or do we need to think about tailoring based on aspects of different people's personal characteristics like virality as one potential example. So this slide, it's a busy slide, but I wanted to show all of these potential items. So we add, uh, we have a scale in our baseline survey that are different motivations to quit smoking. So just to get everyone oriented, each um, row is a different reason why you might want to quit smoking and join the study. We have the column of the first column is everybody. And then we have our um, sample divided by rural and non-rural. And this is about the first 30 people who enrolled in our study to date. And then we also just did a T test to see, are there any differences between our rural and non-rural participants and it was on a, all of these are on a five point um, response scale so one to five is the range um, and I'll just highlight here when we're looking at different motivations to quit smoking in general in this small sample not a lot of statistically significant differences by rural and non-rural smokers except for this one which was notably quite different, which was a difference where rural participants had a much higher ranking of a reason for wanting to quit smoking, being that they know people who have died from smoking. So I'm not saying that we should definitely put in messages that remind smokers who are trying to quit of all the people who died um, in their program, but it's good to know that they do have a different context going into this study where there might be different motivations between these two groups and how those motivations play out could be relevant. The next slide I'm gonna show is my second to last slide. So this is self-efficacy. So similarly to motivations, we ask at baseline, what, um, how confident are you that you would not smoke in, in several different situations? So again, five point scale, organized the same way. You can also see we have the rank order of these means too. So what was the highest rank versus the lowest? Here we don't see any statistically significant differences, but I wanted to point out a few things that I think are interesting. Um, so I've bolded them here. 
So in general, even though these aren't statistically different, our rural group tends to have a lower um, score for the self-efficacy items across almost all of them. So it'll be interesting to see when we have our full sample if we end up seeing that they in general have lower self-efficacy. Um, so that's something we're interested in looking at. We also see a little bit of difference in the rankings of some of these, even if the differences aren't statistically different or, or the means aren't statistically different. So so for example, um, the item, when things aren't going my way, you can see that for our rural participants, they rated that as being less, um, like a higher, um, having higher self-efficacy to not smoke when things aren't going their way versus the non-rural participants. So once we have the full data and we have our follow-up surveys, not only are we going to look for associations between rurality and cessation, but we want to look and see if these motivations and self-efficacy items might be um, affecting smokers from rural and non-rural areas differently as they try to quit smoking. So I just wanted to give that snapshot. Um, and then some next steps is we're going to hopefully complete the study soon. I had a research coordinator who left to go to graduate school. So great for her, unfortunate for me. So we're kind of a lean team right now while we finish up. Um, we're also thinking about using Facebook through UVA Health, some paid Facebook advertisement to help us um, get through the final kind of hurdle of recruitment and obviously complete our analyses. So that is all. I will take questions. I have a quick question. That was really awesome. Really really impressive. Um, what you. were some techniques that you used? You um, referenced word of mouth. How did you get your recruitment? What was like the most key factor in that? Yeah, um, so we had a, several different community partners. And what we've done is anybody who um, we worked primarily through the Cancer Center Center Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. I'm like such a hard acronym for me sometimes, but they are, um, the Cancer Center has staff located across the state specifically to join and build community networks. And so we went through the, the Cancer Center first. They connected us to their local based community health workers and community health advocates. And then they set up either group or one-on-one -on -one meetings with community organizers in their local area. And so they were nice enough to say, you know, we have this academic researcher, she's trying to get this study set up. We would always do one-on-one -on -one conversations with any community group who thought they might wanna be interested in advertising. We're always available for questions. People have liked the, what I didn't mention in the slides, the program we're evaluating is a publicly available program all Ready. And so the, the community and our collaborators seem to have liked that this is something like you could already sign up for this program and use it if you wanted to. But if you join our study, you're helping us learn more about the program and how it's working. Um, and so it's a little bit less of a mystery or kind of maybe a little bit less of an ask. So um, we are just doing it. Um, sometimes our collaborators will email and say, hey, we're going to go to a health fair. Can you mail us some flyers? And so we'll just print them, print them and mail them. So, you know, it's a little slow going because it is kind of one on one conversations. Um, the Department of Health sends out reminder emails across anyone that they interact with through their quit line program. So, yeah, all different types, but we try to just be as open as possible for anyone who's interested in helping us recruit. So there's no, um, you know, black box or grayness about what we're asking for, or what we're trying to do. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Yeah. There's a question in the chat, Kara. I don't know if oh, you can see that. Mm -hmm. I did not see it. I'll read it for you. Interesting oh, data. Yeah. My question okay. is how were different motivations developed? A motivation to decrease anxiety or improve mood is one of our clinical approaches to patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really, a really good question. I think there's many different ways that the motivations develop and where I'm coming into the, the interest in quitting smoking is how do we kind of capitalize on those motivations? So people have many different motivations. And our goal when we're trying to help someone quit smoking is to help them remember that motivator or potentially move their motivation. So they might move more into an action phase than like a thinking about quitting, but not quite ready phase. So um, the, the person, you know, the motivations are unique to the individual and can develop from a lot of different ways, but we just try to capitalize potentially on what any of those motivators might be. I had a question about the yeah. finances as uh, saving 
did I see correctly that saving money was a high motivator, um, but the financial reward was not? Yeah, I think that is true. Um, let me double check. Yes. So to save money was one of the main, was the main motivator to quit smoking, but receiving a financial reward was the least motivating, was like the okay. lowest strength motivator. And so those are slightly, the receiving a financial reward is a strategy that some people have used. It's sometimes called contingency management or like health employers will say, if you're able to quit smoking, you know, we'll reward you with $50 or something like that. So that's what the financial rewards is usually what people are thinking of when they read that versus the cost they incur by purchasing and maintaining, you know, their nicotine dependence would be that first one of to save money. So they're immediately saving money by not smoking. Not everybody who's going to quit smoking though will receive a financial reward. It'd be interesting okay. to know if reductions in insurance costs would fall into the financial reward or in the saving money bin. Yeah, that's a good question. And these are, you know, we used previously validated scales. They're not all there, you know, you hope that they are, but we did include on this baseline survey, we have an unmet needs scale that I didn't show today, but we are trying to understand kind of the interface of motivations, understanding unmet needs, because unfortunately some of our smokers today are also some of the most disadvantaged. They have a lot of financial strain. They have a lot going on and sometimes quitting smoking might help them a lot with their costs, but it's also one of their main, you know, mood regulators and it helps them with their stress and they have a lot of stressors in their lives. So we try, we've tried to take a holistic approach in our baseline survey of, of measuring what could be additional contextual factors. So we can also start to look at some intersections between the, the smoking specific measures with kind of what else is going on in your life kind of measures. And with that, I'm going to thank our scholar alums for being with us today. We are so proud of all of you and enjoying following your, your story um, as you grow in your career. And we'll transition now to go to our second year scholars. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself when you are ready to share your screens. So we'll have... Um, Julia Basso, and then Leanne Johnston, who will be presenting from our second year class. Uh, Julia, I have you up first. Mm -hmm. You're muted, Julia. Julia? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll start that again. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Dr. Julia Basso. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Human Nutrition, Foods, and Exercise and director of the Embodied Brain Lab. So we opened our doors in August of 2021. And my iThrive project is examining the clinical utility of dance to support social skills and behavioral and neural synchrony in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So this project uh, started, I had um, developed what is called the synchronicity hypothesis of dance. So my background, I'm a neuroscientist by training and a dancer by life, I always say. And so um, have really started to kind of fuse these two worlds together. And I developed the synchronicity hypothesis of dance. So evolutionarily speaking, dance is thought to have emerged as a form of interpersonal coordination or synchrony kind of between individuals, a form of communication. So the synchronicity hypothesis of dance was developed to kind of speak to that, that we engage in dance for the purpose of interpersonal synchrony. And that subsequently when we dance, it enhances neural synchrony or these brain oscillations, essentially communicative properties in these brain regions um, in seven distinct neural behavioral regions, specifically um, sensory and motor areas of the brain, um, also cognitive components of the brain, rhythmic aspects 
train in training to music, for example, um, social emotional aspects as well as creative. So there's, it's, it, I consider it an enriched form of physical activity. And subsequently, so if this is at the individual level here, that when we engage in dance with others, that the brain dynamics between individuals become synchronized and we can kind of train this um, phenomenon called interbrain synchrony in dance. And clinically speaking, it's, um, I'm hypothesizing that it's, it's relevant and dance is relevant, training these things uh, is relevant for individuals with autism spectrum disorder where you can see um, there are uh, differences, for example, in some of these motor and sensory processing um, issues and also in uh, verbal and, and nonverbal communication skills. So these, these differences in social uh, kind of elements of behavior. And so uh, the proposal here and what we're studying, um, we're testing the hypothesis that in both neurotypical individuals and individuals with autism spectrum disorder, uh, we can use dance to train social skills and then behavioral and neural synchrony. And so we just conducted in June um, our first permutation of the study in neurotypical individuals. Um, again, it was a four week four week long randomized control trial where individuals were randomly assigned to either an improvisational dance experience or a dance movie watching experience. And they would come into our dance studio um, neuroscience lab here. And what we found from before to after the four week program. So what we're seeing here is the change scores from before to after that four weeks is that individuals showed a significant decrease in, in our, we have our orange here, our dance group and our blue is control. So a significant decrease in stress an improvement in empathy, enhancement in empathy, and an increase in mindfulness. So we were very excited to see um, these neurobehavioral outcomes from our program. And we found that those who showed the biggest decreases in stress or perceived stress showed the largest gains in empathy and the largest gains in mindfulness. Now, along with all these neurobehavioral outcomes, we're looking at both body and brain physiology. So what's going on at the level of the peripheral nervous system, as well as the central nervous system. You can see our setup here. So this is our dance studio neuroscience lab. Um, and we're dancing. We, we utilize the electroencephalography, mobile electroencephalography. And here we're doing uh, mirroring experiences. So as I said, we're kind of training these behavioral synchrony experiences. And we utilize the emote a bit to capture the, the physiological signals as well as our EEG cap to um, capture the brain signals. And so we are actively in the process of analyzing this data. We're really excited about it because um, we're kind of at the frontier of studying the brain in motion. And you can say this is during, we have all these what are called interactive experiences that we do before and after the four weeks. And you can see this is, this is eye gaze. This is us sitting there staring at one another um, Kind of engaging in that that nonverbal form of communication with the eye gaze, uh, nice steady brain signal there. This is us dancing and moving. Um, so you see some kind of motion drift and artifact that we'll remove through pre-processing, um, but the signal is really really quite nice. Um, and then here we have um, our emoto bit signals. You're looking at. Um, blood oxygenation levels. We're interested in looking at heart rate variability and some of these things. So you can see in, in blue, we have one dancer and then in, in orange, another, and you can kind of see our physiological syn uh, signals synchronizing there. So we're now looking at statistical methods to say, you know, is one related to the other and what is the level of synchrony? Um, we are very excited to be pairing with two groups. Um, so the first is the Autism and Neurodevelopmental Institute at George Washington University. Um, we're going to get kind of a co-IRB with them to run the project collaboratively. And also with STEP Virginia, um, they're gonna be coming to our space very soon. We're gonna, it's, it's a program in Virginia called Sensory Plus Theater Equals Endless Possibilities. So um, this group is a performance arts kind of uh, experts in the field, working with individuals with disabilities um, and autism spectrum disorders. So uh, those are kind of things that will emerge and um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Julia, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. In, in the interest of our time today, I'm going to ask for us to keep moving and we'll hold our questions for our presenters until the end, but I would welcome you to put questions in the chat. So if you want to do that, so we don't forget them to come back to them. Mm -hmm.
Okay, Dr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. You may be muted. Yeah, when I share my screen, it all goes away. There you Let's go. Let's try that again. There we go. Can you guys see it? We can't see your slide yet. There, now it is. Uh -huh. There we go. Okay. So my name is Leanne Johnson, and I'm an assistant professor at the UVA School of Nursing. Today, I'm going to present some findings um, from a study that we've conducted while I've been an iThrive scholar that examined lung cancer, comorbidities, and access to care. And what we were really interested in, um, in was how for individuals with lung cancer, having comorbidities influence the ability to access care. No, no, click on it. Uh, there we go. Okay, um, I've provided several maps. So you can see the overlap of lung cancer cases and mortality um, and some of the most common comorbidities. And by looking at these maps, you will note um, that the areas of the country most affected by lung cancer, which is this top one up here, here's the lung cancer cases, um, are also where the comorbidities um, are more concentrated and it's all in the southeastern states. So what we did was conduct a cross-sectional study using the BRFIS data and the comorbidities used in the study were limited to those that were collected as part of the BRFIS survey. So that's why we included these. We categorized um, people into three groups, people with no comorbidities, people with one to two comorbidities and three or more comorbidities. Um, additionally, we collected demographic information so that we could later control for those variables, and we used multivariate logistic modeling for analysis. So this is just a, a brief screenshot here of the questions that we looked at, and it had to do with, was cost an issue? How many physicians do you feel like are your primary care physicians and things like that? So very briefly, most of the sample was female and white. And it's interesting to note that 70% of those with no and one to two comorbidities were over the age of 65, while only 49% with three or more co comorbidities were over the age of 65. So in terms of access to care, 31% of individuals with three or more comorbidities indicated that they had more than one person that they thought of as their personal care doctor. And this is compared to 10.7% of those with no comorbidities and 9.2% of those with one to two comorbidities. And the difference between all the groups was just statistically significant. Uh, we also found significant differences between the three groups when asked if there was a time in the past 12 months when they needed to see a doctor but could not do so because of the cost of seeing that physician. Um, those that affirmed cost was problematic was greatest among individuals with three or more comorbidities. Too many screens. Okay, in terms of access to care, 31% uh, of individuals with three or more comorbidities indicated that they had more than one person. Oh, we did that one. We're down here on this one. Okay. Um, and logistic models with individuals with lung cancer and no comorbidities used as the reference group and controlling for demographic factors. Analysis revealed that individuals with lung cancer having one to two comorbidities were more likely to have needed to see a doctor but could not do so because of the cost. Analysis also revealed that individuals with lung cancer with three or more comorbidities were more likely to have private health care coverage and more likely to have needed to see a doctor within the past 12 months and could not due to cost. So we're still in the process of writing up the paper, but preliminary, preliminarily, we've talked about a couple of things um, that we think might be going on here. So one is we've wondered um, what having more doctors might be doing to continuity, continuity of care for those that have three or more comorbidities? Um, is there a mix up between offices? Is there information being passed along? Do we know what's going on um, with their other specialists? And we've also wondered if 
um, cost that is the most problematic uh, for those with three or more comorbidities, is there a better way that we could service their multiple you know, chronic diseases? And could that be potentially under one specialist that's just a palliative care physician? Which is always my question. How can we streamline someone who's extremely sick um, to get the best care possible? So, thank you. Thank you. I wanna thank our second year scholars. Um, I, I wanna make sure that we have a chance to hear from all of our scholars. So we're gonna go, we're gonna continue with our presentations and then we'll let have save our questions until the end. So we're gonna move to our first year scholars and we'll ask um, Dr. Illiborg to come for, for next. Yeah, mm -hmm. our Bill Borg. yeah, sorry, Christine. Mm -hmm. Can you guys see my slide or notes? We're seeing your notes view. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm Christina Billabore. Uh, I'm, my iThrive project is a randomized controlled trial called Primer. So radical cystectomy is associated with a high number of postoperative complications, with approximately 30 to 70 percent of patients experiencing some type of adverse event, many of which are respiratory in nature. Um, however, there are a few studies geared towards optimizing cardiopulmonary and as well as mental reserve prior to radical cystectomy. So my study is designed to pilot a pre-op rehabilitation program to help mitigate both the psychological and physical impact of radical cystectomy. For the trial, 30 participants um, with bladder cancer be randomized to prehabilitation or usual care. Uh, the prehabilitation group will undergo a home-based exercise regimen that is instructor guided twice weekly. Uh, they will also listen to uh, a relaxation based guided imaging audio daily. Um, all participants will undergo the radical cystectomy. And throughout the study, for, um, cardiopulmonary reserve testing, as well as questionnaires, uh, will be used to document changes in cardiopulmonary reserve, as well as mental state pre and post operatively. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Neville. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you all see my slide? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I actually don't see it. Okay. Yeah. It's a little bit distorted. Um, if oh. you want to, try to share it again. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. How's that? We're we're seeing not. It doesn't look like we're seeing the slide view. Mm -hmm. There you work? go. That's okay. better. Mm -hmm. So um, my name is Rose Neville. I'm a clinical psychologist from the School of Education at UVA, and I'm working under the mentorship of Dr. Micah Mazurik. So this project is addressing the federal health priority of developing health interventions for adults with severe autism. And I'm particularly interested in adults with um, autism and co-occurring intellectual disability. Um, Population-based research shows that adults with autism and co-occurring intellectual disability are about 130 times more likely to experience mental health conditions or psychiatric disorders than all other populations in this population study. So they're at a significant disadvantage for health um, and health intervention, um, but they really need it. So what we're going to be doing with this intervention is developing a mindfulness-based um, intervention for emotion regulation. Right now, we are looking at um, protocols to modify, and what we'll be doing is incorporating feedback from key stakeholders, specifically autistic adults, caregivers, and professionals, to take this protocol and modify it, um, taking the um, communication um, and behavioral difficulties of this autism subpopulation into account. In early 2023, we'll be piloting the intervention um, with a small cohort and we'll be involving um, their caregivers in the intervention to facilitate adults' engagement. 
We're also hoping to or planning to capture quite a wide array of data from adults to facilitate our ability to detect change. We'll be collecting behavioral self-report, caregiver report, and psychophysiological data collected through smartwatches um, with the goal of detecting um, a variety of different aspects of changes in emotion regulation. And as a follow-up exploratory goal, we're going to be looking at machine modeling techniques to determine if we can establish um, a predictive model of emotion regulation and treatment change as a result of interventions targeting emotion regulation in this population. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Lozano? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try to share my screen. Do you see my slides okay? We're not seeing the slide view, um, if you want okay, to. Okay, let me switch. Um, what about now? We see your notes view now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's annoying. Let's see. There you go. Now we okay. got mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, so hello, my name is Patricia Rodriguez Lozano. From the, I'm assistant professor from the Department of Medicine Division of Cardiology, and I am one of the first year um, scholars. My project is titled Novel Therapy to Treat Microvascular Disease in Women. And why our project is important, um, as we know, heart disease is a leading cause of death in men and also in women. And women have a unique phenotype with fewer calcified lesions and more non-obstructive coronary artery disease and more microvascular disease. Today, there is lack of appropriately designed outcomes trial investigating therapeutic strategies targeting microvascular disease. So clearly there is an unmet need for novel therapies um, for, for this. And we thought about SDLT2 inhibitors and as a possible therapy for microvascular disease. This is a new drug approved uh, for treatment of diabetes and that has demonstrated a significant improvement in cardiovascular outcomes in patients with diabetes and without diabetes. Our hypothesis is that SDLT2 inhibitors might improve micro microvascular dysfunction by improving coronary flow reserve measured by a stress quantitative um, cardiac MRI. Our design is a clinical trial, it's a double blind randomized um, to receive SDLT2 inhibitors versus placebo for 12 months. And we will do a baseline stress MRI and uh, after completed therapy, another one. Um, our M1 is to determine the efficacy of SDLT2 inhibitors in improving coronary flow reserve. And our M2 is to determine whether the, the uh, therapy with SDLT2 inhibitors improve quality of life measurements. Thank you. And we have one of our first year scholars who was not able to be with us today. And so he has instead sent um, his video. And so I'm gonna share that with you now for our last center. Mm -hmm. In our lab, we are interested in a disease called diffuse intrinsic ponding glioma, DIPG. And given the location of DIPG that arise from the brainstem area, uh, it is surgically unresectable. And the five-year survival is less than 1%. And currently, there is no targeted therapy available. The common mutation in DIPG is histone H3 lysine uh, to methionine mutation and P53 mutation. And those both mutations are unfortunately not targetable at the moment. Recently, we discovered that two methyl transferases as new cancer dependencies in DIPG and SD1 and SD2. At this point, there's no effective small molecule inhibitors available for these enzymes. Therefore, we are working with Virginia Tech Center for Drug Discovery to develop a new assay to screen for novel NSD1 inhibitors. In this particular case, we found that the PWWP2 domain of NSD1 
is a crucial site for its activity, and it interacts with a protein called NONO. So we decided to take uh, to leverage for this interaction and develop a threat-based assay by mapping the interaction between NSD1 and NONO and use YFP and CFP-based threat in order to screen for uh, 20,000 compounds and looking for inhibitory compounds that can enter the PWWP domain to block this interaction. Eventually, we hope to validate the results of the, the screening for potential uh, NS2 inhibitors in order to treat the disease eventually. Okay. Who has a burning question that they would really like to ask in this probably final minute or so before we wrap up and go back to the main session? Mm -hmm. All right, I'll try it without the echo this time. Uh, Leanne, I have a question for you. It seems counterintuitive that people with more morbidities, therefore having greater challenges to affect their ability to hold down a job and since job is so linked in a disease so, uh, so linked to um, having insurance that they would that those people would be more likely to have private insurance is it that there's a lag between the diagnosis of multiple comorbidities and the transition to um, uh, you know central payer insurance or do you have any other theories as to why you're seeing that so we thought about that one because it is really odd. And we were like, well, I guess they could be on their spouse's insurance um, so that it doesn't get canceled. Um, one of the directions that we're, we're going after this study is to look at Medicaid data um, so that we can look at that low income population and see sort of what's going on there. But it's hard to tease out in the Burfus data just because all we get is like, check, I've been diagnosed with lung cancer, but we don't know stage. We don't know, you know, how long they've been in care, if they had curative intent versus, you know, palliative care. So one of the limitations to that data set for sure. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for your time today and our scholars for presenting. Um, we need to head back to the main room for the wrap-up session. So if you just want to click leave room, don't leave the session completely. Just go head back to the main room. Leave the breakout, okay? Mm -hmm. Looks like we may have everyone back from the sessions. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your afternoon with the IPRF Scholar Symposium. Thank you to each of you for being here and for hanging with us. I don't know if Dr. Claw is still with us, but we really appreciate her thought-provoking talk. I thought that was a fantastic um, representation of her expertise. Thank you to the scholars and the scholar alums for your um, presentation of your work and for your patience um, with us today. Please know that all these slides and the information from Dr. Claw will be posted on the iDrive website, so you'll have a chance to go back and revisit those sessions you didn't get to attend um, or Dr. Claw's information. But if there are people you want to reach out to to collaborate with or to just get more information on their work, please don't hesitate to reach out individually. Um, don't forget the RFA for the Scholars Program is on the iDrive website, and we encourage you to share it with um, folks that you think would be a good fit for the program. Thank you again from all of us at iThrive. We appreciate your partnership and your presence, and we hope you have a great afternoon and evening. Bye.